all sitting in a white oak bell cradle. The cradle is probably original to the bell, which is dates to 1817. So the bell and cradle actually predate this church building. Um, it's all white oak. It's an incredible structure. It needs some work. But this will fly out bell first, and then we'll invert the cradle, and it will fly right out the opening that the spire was in. And it will come down, and we're going to be putting it on a, uh, on a hay wagon, and it's going to go into storage. Um, but hopefully we're going to make it visible to the public in a couple of different venues. Hill, and you can see how old this is because you see the butterfly. This is a, a wrought iron rod yes. and a butterf butterfly wedge. There's, yeah. not a, there's not a nut on that. Yeah. There's, no, okay. there's no, uh, no threads at all. Yeah. The blacksmith uh, uh, punched a hole <clears> through <throat> it and drove the wedges, probably hot. And when it shrank, it got tight. And that's, how, that's why we know this is really old. Now, they've added some things to it here, but this, this, is, this is all quite old. Even this stuff is quite old. Um, and of course, this all balances the bell. The yoke is and the steel. Oh, this is solid. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That is a counterweight yes. for the weight of the bell. Since 1842, the Paul Revere Bell has been heard across the Topsfield Town Common, one of the best preserved rural town centers in New England. Set up as a military training field in the 17th century, the common was used by the militia in early colonial times. Local Minutemen gathered here before departing for Concord and Lexington and later Bunker Hill. The common is ringed by buildings representing several of the great periods of American architecture from colonial times through the 20th century. Here we have the commons building, the Parson Capon House, Emerson Center, the Town Library, Proctor School, the Town Hall, and finally the Meeting House. I'm Martha Morrison and I'm a member of the Building Committee for the Steeple Project. I've been involved in a number of other projects around the Topsfield Common Historic District and we've learned that this area is important not only for our heritage but also for the very vital day-to-day -day life of Topsfield whether it be Proctor School with the school buses bringing hundreds of children into the center every day, or the library that has one of the highest circulation rates of the, um, in the Commonwealth, or even Town Hall where people go to pay their taxes, pay their bills, get information, uh, whatever it might be. The Common Historic District is in fact very much a part of the day-to-day -day vitality of our community. And it's not just for Topsfield. We know that over 10,000 cars a day pass in front of the Congregational Church Meeting House as people pass through the center of Topsfield on their way to work uh, or school or wherever they might be going in the morning and then again in the evening. This is why the Topsfield Planning Board and the Board of Selectmen, the Main Street Foundation, and the Historic District Commission have all been so supportive of the efforts of the Congregational Church to, em to embark upon this uh, restoration project for the Meeting House. Uh, when we first looked at this building, we knew obviously that there was an issue because the spire is leaning hard to the rear of the building and off to the right hand side, which would be the uh, north side. Um, and then, of course, we came up and investigated. The first thing we saw was an entire wall full of insulation and stuff, so we had to remove that. And then we start seeing some of the issues that have been um, dealt with in years past. We have quite a timeline of repair for this church. About every 15 years has been that had a major repair done. Um, and this is the type of repair that we're seeing. We're seeing um, gussets of steel channel iron added to very, very critical portions of the, of the church steeple. Now when I say steeple, the steeple is made up of three parts. The spire, which is the, the, the tall, thin uh, top of the church, then the belfry where the bell and bell cradle sits, and then the tower base. We are standing in the tower base looking basically at the ceiling of the church. The, the ceiling of the sanctuary is just below us here. Um, it's a vaulted ceiling so all the plaster and lath you know, curves down and then comes up and meets the truss. The truss that is behind me is a uh, king post truss. This is the king post right here. It's a parallel rafter cord. That's the that's the roof, and then below it is another parallel cord that helps support the king post. 
and that's what allows this free open span in the sanctuary. Okay, the 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 steeple that we're working on sits on this truss at the rear, and on the front sits on a beam that is held up by posts that are supported to the ground. Um, what that means is that as the building settles because of its own weight, it'll tend to lean back because the truss is the weaker link. It doesn't have something going all the way to the ground. So the truss has to be reinforced, and this is reinforced. All of the trusses are very, very strong, and that's very much to our benefit. Um, but water penetrates the steeple, runs downhill, and tends to rot the structural frame from the inside out. And that's exactly what's happened here. If you look in this corner where the steel gussets are, the actual wood behind the steel is just pretty well shot. It's holding together, and uh, we're glad that they did this work, but it, it's, it's not going to straighten the spire. It's not going to be structurally adequate for the long term. So our, our, our goal this time is to use traditional methods and timber to replace and repair the existing structure so that we have a solid traditional frame that will hold up for the hundred years that it held up the first time. The Meeting House is the symbol of Topsfield. It appears on phone books, postcards, real estate agency ads, and all sorts of other materials. It is Topsfield's face to the wider world. More important, this building has watched since 1842 as Topsfield has grown from a rural farming community with a tiny population to a family community bustling with activity. It has provided over Topsfield fair parades and strawberry festivals from their beginnings. The Meeting House has been a gathering point for the community in good times and bad since before the Civil War for over 160 years. Its bell has tolled in mourning and in joy for events that have touched our lives for many generations. Uh, my name is Boyd Jackson. I'm a member of the Board of Selectmen, have been for seven years, uh, have served as chairman of the Board of Selectmen, not currently chairman, but uh, uh, have been asked to uh, talk a little bit about what the church uh, and this building uh, means to the town of Topsville. In my opinion, it means a great deal. Uh, when that building was built, it was important enough to the town uh, that the town agreed to uh, uh, give a piece of property to the church on which it could be built. Uh, interestingly enough, the piece of property that the church actually sits on uh, is owned by the church. But the surrounding property is owned by the town. And uh, it was a meeting house where town fathers met before the days we had a town hall. Uh, so it was a, a very important building uh, from its very early stages. It's important to the people of the town of Topsfield today because in my opinion that building and the other buildings that surround the common pretty much epitomize what, what, a, what a lot of people see as what Topsfield is and what it represents. Uh, it's not uncommon for towns in New England to uh, be proud of their town common and I have been told uh, that Topsfield has one of the prettiest town commons in New England. Uh, this building is very definitely part of that and, and presents that kind of an image not only to the people of the town of Topsfield but people who travel through the town of Topsfield. Was ever worked on. Are you going to use pegs as well? We'll use mortise and tenon joinery, traditional joinery with pegs uh, to hold the joints together. There's, there's a reason for that other than just historical accuracy. The reason is uh, very structural in nature. It's in the sense that it's the strongest building system we know and it's very rigid yet flexible enough to accommodate the weather patterns that hit the spire. And that's why we're going back to wood. Um, uh, steel gussets are generally put on in areas to, to span areas of rot and what happens is the heat and cold cycles that happen in this attic tend to, um, tend to keep this steel moist and it rots the wood. It accelerates the rot of the wood that it's fastened to 
and that's why, uh, and it's much stronger than the wood that it's fastened to. So locking this corner together with steel means that these other corners have to flex more or compensate for this sort of rigid, tied together, damaged area. And so it's, it's, it's a dynamic system. If this doesn't move at all and the wind hits this, it's going to have to move somewhere else and you get excessive movement, you get flashing open up and then the water comes in and it rots. So you get this sort of, um, you know, the cyclical rot pattern that comes from patching one area and leaving one area, mm -hmm. you know, that's going to get, that's going to take the brunt of the next wind. Um, and that's why we want all of this wood to be put back um, in its traditional form because the original joiner, Mark Jewett, whose signature is right behind us here, actually. Um, you can see his signature right here. It's a little hidden, but that's Mark Jewett's signature, and the date behind that 2x4 is 1842. We're going to take that 2x4 off. <laughs> Good. But that's, it's just nice. It's very rare to see the signature showing up, um, but that's, we have documentation of that. So can you see that well enough? Yep. Yes. Yes. Why is it called a meeting house? In the earliest Puritan days, when the town was founded, whenever people had to get together for something, to worship or to conduct the business of the community, they went to the meeting house. It was not possible to separate the town from the church in those days. Records of the early town meetings include debates about the cost of a new pulpit, as well as the cost of road repairs. Even the minister was chosen in an open town meeting, and his salary was paid by a tax on all the residents of the town. Church and town were one and the same until 1823, when the Commonwealth of Massachusetts separated the two. The church building, though, continued to be known as the Meeting House, as a reminder of the origins of the town. My name is Ethan Foreman. I'm a reporter with the Salem News. Uh, and I was uh, uh, found out about the Congregational Church steeple while I was at a selectman meeting. And uh, you know, being at a selectman meeting, uh, there's a lot of things that come up, and, and they don't always come up directly. Uh, the fact that they were going to uh, lift the steeple and the belfry off the, uh, off the church was not apparent at first when uh, Martha Morrison and, and I believe Elizabeth Mulholland came in looking for permission to place an Aspire uh, fundraising uh, campaign sign in front of the church. And it was an intriguing sign because the sign was shaped in a, in a, in a triangle. And uh, the, they hadn't talked about the project at all. And so I, um, I pigeonholed Martha Morrison uh, after the meeting. And I said, uh, what's this all about? And she said, why, we're going to lift the steeple off the, uh, off the uh, church. And we've hired the guy who uh, uh, renovated the Gould Barn. And not only that, but inside the belfry, which no one has seen in over 150 years, is a, a, a Paul Revere bell dating back to 1817 that was in the prior meeting house. And I said, Martha, you know, how much is this project going to be worth? She's like, it's, it's, uh, this is a big project. It'll be about uh, half a million dollars. And I said, great. Uh, can I write about it? She goes, not yet. <laughs> We're going to do a press release. So uh, I gave, them, gave her a little time. I didn't want to wait till she wrote a press release. Um, I had other things to do. I was afraid that the uh, other newspapers would find out about it. So I bugged her. And I said, well, I want to write a story about it. So I went running around the town. I said, I want to see the bell. And they said, you can't see the bell. I go, why? They go, it's up, uh, up a staircase, uh, a big iron ladder. And I said, well, OK, I'll get as close to the ladder as I can, I mean, uh, the bell as I can. And I came to the Emerson Center. I said, can I see the bell? And uh, Larry Atkins took me across the street and showed me a rope, a thin rope. Uh, in the foyer, right by the door, he said, that's the rope to the bell. And I had imagined this sort of big rope, this big Quasimodo rope, you know, that you could, and you could look up into the, the uh, steeple and see the bell. And he just said, no, this is it. And he takes it, and he just starts ringing it. And I'll never forget, and he just couldn't just pull it. He had to go up all, all the way down and then just pull all the way down. And you could hear this bell pealing all over uh, Tossfield. And, um, 
uh, I had interviewed Martha and I had interviewed Elizabeth and um, my editor said to me, uh, the picture of Larry is nice, it's not good enough, you have to get a picture of the bell. So Elizabeth Mulholland uh, bravely took me up there and uh, at the time you had to crawl up a ladder, a metal ladder, I don't know how many feet up, 30 feet up, and it was one of the scariest things I've ever had to do, carrying a notepad and a camera. And uh, I was just like, I hope my insurance at work is, uh, is all set. So we went up. We made our way up the ladder. We went up uh, another uh, staircase, another rickety wooden staircase. And as we were going up, Elizabeth was explaining how the uh, steeple was put together. You could see the uh, interior timber frames. You could see where uh, people who had worked on the steeple over the years had signed the uh, timbers. And she told me there was a fellow by the name of Mark Jewett who had, uh, who had uh, actually signed one of the boards. And at that time, you couldn't see his uh, signature. Uh, but we, we were able to climb up and we saw the bell. And at the time, the bell was uh, basically invisible to the rest of the town. It was hidden behind these great big slats. And the slats were covered with uh, chicken wire to keep the pigeons out. And so while people could uh, you know, basically hear the bell, they couldn't see it. And people were telling me they hadn't seen the bell. They'd never seen the bell. And this was brought home to me when they finally did lift the bell off and they placed it on a hay wagon. And I met a, 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 a parishioner, I believe her name was Emily Gould, and she'd, uh, she was in her 80s. She'd been a, per, uh, you know, uh, uh, a congregant all her life, practically all her life. And she said, I'd never seen the bell. She'd never seen, she lived in Tosspill all her life. She'd probably been to that church thousands of times and never you know, witnessed it. So I, because of that, because of the historical connection to Paul Revere and 1817 Paul Revere and Sun Bell, I think that's what really got us excited that there was this historical connection to a founding father of the United States. There is a very few of these bells in existence. And it really showed that Topsfield had something special. I mean, the church, and the church is a wonderful building, um, but that just made it just that much more special for us. Um, but Mark Jewett was an apprenticed joiner. We know that because his family um, was based in Raleigh. Uh, his brother Aaron was up in uh, the Stratum area, and we, we've seen his work. So this was a well, you know, a knowledgeable joiner. Who obviously he was, or this wouldn't have survived as well as it did. Um, um, so anyway, we know some of this repair work was done in the 40s. We know some of it was done in the 70s. It definitely allowed the building to stay up, um, but at this point we're we're kind of uh, we're ready to do a real full-scale restoration that will allow us to get, you know, 50 or 60 years of solid, you know, um, time before we have to do some maintenance. Now that doesn't mean you're not going to do annual maintenance. You are to keep the water out. That's the one thing about working in this century. We have a good way, we've got copper, we've got ice and water shield, we've got ways to keep the water out that they did not have access to. So the benefit of putting it back traditionally, giving us the structural integrity with modern roofing techniques is gonna allow this to really last. This is a replacement post, we believe, from the 1970s. Um, you can see the joinery is simply a, a steel gusset plate with no joinery in the timber at all, everything's nailed. Um, but I wanted to point out this uh, steel here this is steel attached to the bed timber. This is the base timber for the whole steeple. And the bed timber behind the steel gusset is in fact severed in half about right here. Um, and the gusset plate doesn't go all the way to the truss. So in a sense, they've sort of band-aided this bed timber, which is probably one of the more critical elements of the whole, of the whole tower and, and directly impacts the lean of the spire. Because of course, if you drop an inch here, you're gonna see six or eight inches up. The meeting house was not always located on the common. The first meeting house was located near Howlett Street and Meeting House Lane, hence the name. The second meeting house was built in what is now Pine Grove Cemetery because the settlers in Rowley Village, now Boxford, agreed to share in the expense of a minister if the meeting house was closer to their settlement. 
The third and fourth meeting houses were erected on or near the location of the fifth and present building. The meeting house has important connections elsewhere in Essex County. Mark Richards Jewett, a master builder from Ipswich and Rowley, constructed this Greek Revival meeting house in 1842. His signature was discovered on a rafter in the structure, and further research has determined that he was responsible for the construction of meeting houses in Rowley, West Boxford, Hamilton and Wenham, and possibly other Essex County congregational churches. Through this project, we are learning a great deal about how these buildings were constructed, an almost lost art. Well, I'm, I'm Gregor Smith, and I'm chairman of the building committee. This is a committee that was formed by the Board of Trustees a couple of years ago. It includes myself, Elizabeth Mulholland, and Martha Morrison. We were charged with managing the project to restore the meeting house. Part of this effort has involved identifying what the real problems are with the meeting house and identifying the team the appropriate team that we should bring on board to design appropriate improvements and execute the project. But the reason that we're taking the spire and the belfry out is because we need to do this kind of work down here. We can't lift this up with all of that material if, on top. Just strip it down, so right. Take yeah, it down yeah. carefully, do the repairs out in the field, which is much safer and much more economically feasible and it allows us to then bring jacks and rigging in here and pick up this tower one corner at a time and do the repairs. Um, all right, we're talking about uh, how we're going to lift this out and also how it might have been done originally. Um, essentially, the four posts of the belfry are quite a, make a quite a rigid structure. And when we go up to the bell level, I'll show you how we're going to rig it to extract it. But it does come down, this is mortise and tenon into a bed timber that crosses across the two trusses. This is the, the rafter pair here, and the bed timber is right behind us here. I don't know if you get a picture of that or not. Mm -hmm. But that goes across the truss and transfers load from this structure into the tower base, which is, of course, supported by the roof trusses and the posts to the ground. So all your load paths go all the way to the ground eventually. Um, the mortise and tenon joint here at the post where it enters into the bed timber, the pin will be pulled from that. So it's just a wooden pin? Just a wooden peg, yep. We'll pull that peg and then as we rig it upstairs we'll have the crane come in and actually pick it above us um, so that the bottom of this will hang. You want, when you're extracting a large element out of another one, you want it to be bottom heavy. You can't have yep. it top heavy. It is, yes, yes. In other words, you can't lift it from down here. You have to lift it from above. Um, but because this is damaged, we're going to actually, um, we can't trust this joint to stay together when we pull it out. Okay? Right. So what that means is when we put in our rigging beams above, and we'll show you where that's going to be, we're going to bring chains down and actually wrap around the post at this level. So in a sense, from our rigging beams, we are lifting the bottom of the belfry, okay? That way we know that we're grabbing solid material and we're not letting this hang. And we're just going to secure all that again before we lift it out. So as if that's why it takes about two to three weeks to do the preparation. It's not you can just come in and pop it off. There's a lot of preparation that has to happen. And of course, there are window, there, not window, but... Uh, there are uh, trim details all around this perimeter that have to be removed carefully, cataloged and taken off site to, to repair and uh, before the extraction process as well. Um, original joiners may very well have built this box in place and stood up the outside posts, attached them to the truss, and then from there they had a couple of different options. They could build this belfry within this structure because it's a smaller structure and you have enough room to bring the mortise and tenon joinery together. Um, and then from the outside box posts, which are quite, quite strong, it's possible with ropes to actually lift this up into its location and then slide the bed timber underneath it. And that could have also been done with the spire. Um, we don't have a lot of documentation on how they put these things together, but that's one way that we've seen some early writings on. The other way was in fact essentially the same process we're doing with the crane except they were using a, 
a derrick of sorts, building a derrick that would allow to lift an entire structure from outside and swing over the opening and lower it down on ropes with block and tackle. And that rope would probably go onto the ground to what's called a cap stand, which is simply a, a cylinder that, that would wind the rope up and the, an animal would probably turn that rope. That like on the ships again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Raising there's, the anchor. Again, there's a lot of overlap. Sure in the, in the yeah. technology yeah. Um, because they're working with wood and, and timber joinery. Um, but you can gain so much leverage with a block and tackle, especially for block and tackles. Uh, this, is, this is heavy, um, but it's not outrageously heavy. You know, I mean, an, an animal could have, could have had enough force with the leverage of the block and tackle to, to, to lift this up. Um, there's not a lot of evidence inside the tower to tell you where they rigged it and so forth. We always look for it. And occasionally we find something that's somewhat mysterious that may very well have been part of the rigging process. Um, the other way they could have built it is just one piece at a time, you know, building on uh, each deck. Um, but I think uh, that's a difficult way to do it. Um, have the advantage of having it on the ground and building it on the ground is, is, is obvious. It's just a lot easier to do. Um, it's amazing to consider how these buildings were built. These were before the days of architectural plans, structural engineers, and building codes. Master framers came to town, drew out the footprint of the building on the ground, and began the work of framing the building. They had a design in their heads and the skill to construct tall buildings that telescope from the ground up. To do our work, we had to actually create architectural plans so we could reconstruct the building as it was originally designed. We d decided that we needed to hire a, an architect who would define the scope of work for this project. And with that scope of work uh, laid out on paper, we could, we could deliver that to multiple contractors who could then give us some co competitive pricing. The architect we brought on board was Bill Finch of Finch and Rose, who is a superb preservation architect and has a great deal of experience working with buildings like ours, with buildings who have issues like ours has. Bill thoroughly documented the meeting house from top to bottom. As a testimony to the quality of the original construction, the steeple of the meeting house stood straight and tall for more than 100 years. Our harsh New England climate finally took its toll, and repairs were undertaken in the late 1940s. Even the state-of-art job done then could not fix the problems. Water infiltration has led to rot and paint deterioration of the steeple and the main facade. More specifically, there are rotted beams in the base of the tower between the tower posts and the roof trusses, and rotted timbers in the belfry roof and the floor. As a result, the belfry and spire tilt toward the north, and the wet and rotten wood cannot hold a coat of paint. We focused on, after some deliberation, on preservation timber framing because of the extensive experience that they brought in particular to uh, the project with, with work on timber framing structures, uh, timber frame structures and, and historic structures. There are few people, I think, who know as much about these kinds of buildings as, as Aaron Sturgis. And he really impressed us in uh, the thoughtful approach he took to analyzing the building and analyzing how he would deal with, with correcting its issues. Before we went through this process of interviewing Aaron and, and his competitors, we were thinking of the Meeting House project as a, as a repair project. Aaron was the first one who really started to help us focus on this as a restoration project. There's quite a lot of damage here, especially in this corner here. Um, that's the uh, um, that's the northwest corner. 
of the building, of the, of the steeple. Just extensive, extensive damage. Um, this crab, these beams are, are what's called the crab. Um, and they are extremely rotten. If you, I don't know if you can see that or not, but it's just literally uh, coming apart. Um, and this is all a direct result of the roof above the, above the uh, belfry just completely leaking like a sieve. Now, we know for a fact that these timbers were added. Um, it is not a part of the original structure that Mark Jewett built, and it's really not structurally sound enough to um, stay together. In other words, uh, they cut out areas of rock in the spire, added these timbers in, and the only mechanism holding them down to the belfry are these, these four brackets. And that means that the spire can just move freely in the wind. Oh, and as it moves freely, it opens up the roof. Oh. And the water comes in, and it, again, that cycle starts again. All right? Um, so what we're going to be doing, the first task of removing the spire, is to rig the spire so that it can be lifted again the same way, from up top, leaving the bottom heavy. And uh, we haven't installed the chains, but a chain will come from our rigging beam, down around this crab and we'll essentially lift the spire out from below but the thing will be stable so it can't tip one way or the other. Um, and once we have the spire off, uh, we'll swing it to the ground on a temporary crab so that each of the spire rafters, which are the tall thin um, rafters that create the spire, okay. have solid ground to sit on on the ground and then we'll basically take it apart. Um, you had a question before about the, the shipwright versus the joiner. Well, this is the center mast of the spire. Um, it's a continuous piece, the whole length of the spire, a little over 30 feet long. Um, and, it, and what it does is act like a pendulum. You know, what it, the uh, spire rafters come together at the top. The mast holds all the tops of the spire rafters together. And when wind comes against the spire, the mast, of course, like a pendulum, would work in the opposite direction. So it keeps it quite stable. And of course, we'll be doing quite a bit of repair to that to make sure that it works. Um, quite a bit of repair done in here. They added plywood gussets um, just to hold this frame together. Um, some of these posts are actually uh, spliced at the roof level because they rotted away the last time. Remember I showed you the three posts downstairs yes. that were all laminated? Well, they're scarfed, they're scarfed into that. So uh, we, have to, we have to really secure that together before we lift this off. And we're going to take the plywood off in order to make sure that what's behind the plywood is sound enough to fly. The first step in fixing these problems was the removal of the steeple all the way to the top of the portico. We don't know for sure how the builder raised these parts of the building into place back in 1842, but today a crane is used to remove them and to put them back in place. For about four months, the restoration work took place on the front lawn of the meeting house, using the very same techniques as the original builders. Uh, hi, I'm Liz Mulholland and I am a member of the Congregational Church and also have a background in historic preservation, which is saving old buildings and old things and old stories. And so I was asked to be on the Capital Campaign Committee in order to find out whether or not there were grants out there that we would qualify for to restore the steeple church. Um, we decided to start with a, a grant to the National Trust for Historic Preservation and that grant enabled us to have a conditions assessment done on the steeple which details in great detail the issues that the building has and we used a preservation architect to do that who gave us an unbiased opinion about what those issues were rather than relying on a contractor who might be looking to get the job and so on and so forth. And we, pursued, we pursued three other grants and the first one was to the Massachusetts Historical Commission and that was successful. They give money for actual bricks and mortar work, or actual physical fabric work, and we received $50,000 last, um, last fall, we found out about that. And that was the highest award that they gave out, and we were about among, I can't remember exactly, something like 20 some odd uh, organizations that received money this past year from the state. 
And then we also applied to the Essex National no, Heritage Dad. Commission. No, this is Henry. Hi, uh, the Henry. Essex National Heritage Commission. And that's an organization that specifically cares about the history, culture, architecture uh, uh, of no. Essex County. And we applied to their grant program called the, uh, I think it's Preservation Projects Fund. And we received the largest amount that they were would give out too this past year. And so those that was seven and a half thousand dollars. And so those two grants will go directly towards work to be done on the building. And then we applied to the Topsfield Historical Society through the Kimball Scholarship Program. And while that money is not something that they give out for actual work to a building, what it what it is for is, is where it, it it adds to the body of knowledge about Topsfield history. And because we're taking a restoration approach with the church, we, we made an argument that documenting that approach, both before the work was done, while the work was done, and after, uh, we'll document that so that that information can be available to people that are interested in the project in, as a whole, whether they're interested in architecture or timber framing or any of the other history that we've uncovered in the process of doing the research on the building. And so we were three for three, really. Four for four. National Trust, Mass Historic Commission, Essex National Heritage Commission, and the Topsfield Historic Commission. Four for four. And what's really neat is we went from very local to regional to state and to national. We got recognition from all levels possible other than, you know, the greater universe. Um, and that's really exciting, I think. And, and also speaks to the issue of how important it is that we do restore this building properly and document the history of it and keep it around for everyone to uh, enjoy, whether you're part of the church or not. As a community, we treasure the historic buildings surrounding the Topsfield Common. They create a sense of place that is uniquely ours. Integral to the character of the village and symbols of Topsfield's historic memory they give us a direct and meaningful link to our past. We have an obligation to preserve them for future generations. So far, grants from the National Trust of Historic Preservation, the Massachusetts Historical Commission, the Essex National Heritage Commission, and the Topsfield Historical Society testify to the importance of the meeting house from a national and local levels. Church members have pledged more than half the cost of the project. We hope that the wider community of Topsfield will also help in this effort. Finally, Steeple Removal Day, July 28.
just going! <laughs> oh, that is it. Just when we thought we were not going yeah. to the Right here, they're gonna put it right in here. So yeah. I heard I'm shape, isn't it? Thank <laughs> you. 